It has been a pleasure to be here. I'm glad you're out here tonight. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 14. We'll spend some time there. We've got a message tonight I want to preach. And uh, so far it looks like the Lord is kind of leading in this direction. I couldn't get more confirmation. I don't think the song we just sang threw off the lifeline. You know that lifeline is Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. And even the comment that John made, it's not always for the lost. Sometimes the Lord's uh, interested in saving us out of situations that we find ourselves in. Right. And I've got two titles for the message. You can use either one you want. I've got when God asks you to do the impossible, but then I'm kind of partial to the title. It's a little bit shorter. Walking on what? So you probably already know where we're going here. But Matthew chapter 14, and we'll begin to read in uh, verse 22. Now, Jesus has been working miracles all through this chapter. Uh, John was beheaded. He fed 5,000 people. And, of course, he sent his disciples across, or he's about to. Let's just, just pick up the reading here in verse 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou bid me, come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. There it is. Peter's not lost. He just needs some help. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. As a result of this miracle, uh, there was some uh, faith that was strengthened. There was some belief that was established. But let's bow our heads and pray this, this evening before I preach. And uh, again, I apologize for having to leave right afterwards. If I haven't shaken your hand, why introduce yourself to me after the service? I think I've just about touched everybody, and if I did not... Shake your hand. I'm not sliding you. I just didn't get around to you. But uh, be sure and say uh, something to me before I leave tonight. But let's bow and pray. Father, tonight, Lord, we are grateful for your goodness to us. God, uh, I'm grateful for the leading here with the singing, with the song, several cues for me uh, in regards to this sermon. I trust the Holy Spirit uh, is guiding and directing, and I pray, God, you fill me, use me, help me. I've never preached a perfect sermon, Lord, but I'd like to, and this would be as good a time as any. Amen. I pray that you help me. And then, Holy Spirit of God, convict us in our hearts, God, so that we might be better Christians, better followers of thee as a result of being in this camp meeting. Lord, be with the meeting the rest of the week. Be with Davis. He comes, hopefully, safely, getting up here, getting settled in, and, and taking care of the preaching duties the rest of the week. God, I pray that you attend it. Uh, stays up and good and, and, and help us with the weather. I know it's supposed to be warm, but God, we know you control all these things. So please bless the meeting now, this 40th anniversary camp meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, in the 14th chapter, Jesus has worked some miracles, feeding 5,000 people. He was in the habit of uh, working miracles. If you know anything about uh, the Christ of the Bible, his ministry revolved around miracles when he chose his 12 disciples. They had no idea what they were in for. And when they entered the sphere, they saw so many things, so many miracles. It's, uh, it, it's no wonder they were as confused as they were at times. I uh, noted the fact that he was 
working at this particular time around the Sea of Galilee. He often worked around the water. He called many of his disciples from fishing in this very sea, the Sea of Galilee. I was kind of surprised when I uh, checked on the statistics of it. It's a, a rather small lake. You know, I mentioned Lake Erie the other day and, the, and the, how treacherous the smaller lakes are. But this lake is only about eight miles at its widest point. It's only about 13 miles long, and it's only about 150 feet deep. I, I don't know what that is in comparison to some lakes, but 150 feet sounds like a lot of water to me. But again, it's a, a rather small lake in, in comparison to other lakes. Uh, he ministered much around the water. The water was brought into the ministry. John the Baptist came baptizing. He not only ministered around the water, he ministered in the water. If you remember one time, he, he commandeered Peter's ship. And he had Peter cast off from the shore. And he preached from a boat. Because the crowds were so big, he couldn't accommodate them on the land. But I don't want to discuss one of those miracles that is around the water or in the water. But tonight we're going to look at a miracle that happened on the water. And I just think it's wonderful that he included one of his disciples yeah. in on that miracle. You know, we've gotten in on some of what God's been doing, haven't we? Yes. I mean, over the course of the last 30 or 40 years, I know God has allowed me to be a part of some things that he has done. And I've seen him do some amazing things. But we'll begin here looking at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. And we'll kind of work our way through this passage of scripture. Not necessarily a, a topical message. But uh, in verse 22, it says this, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. That word constrained means he had to put some pressure on them. I can't, I, I can understand them not necessarily wanting to leave the Savior after what he has just done. And all the, they were afraid they were going to miss something. I don't know about you, but one of the main things that kept me faithful to church when I was a new Christian was that I was afraid I was going to miss something. Yeah. I was afraid that God was going to do something in a service and I would not be there. And the only way I'd know about it is if somebody told me about it. Yep. And I didn't want to hear it secondhand. Yes, of course, it's caused me to sit through some services and be in church till midnight a few times. <laughs> when God began to move and, and things were happening. Yes, and I was, I was tired, but I was thankful to be there. I was glad I didn't hear it from somebody else. I had to sit through some rather long invitation times. I remember uh, Rex Harrison playing the piano down at Hope, uh, one of our Bible conferences. No preaching going on, but Rex just got to play the piano, and people just started coming to the altar. And the Lord just moved in. The Holy Spirit just ministered Amen. to needs that, that no preacher probably knew anything about. And preachers probably all preaching all around the needs. And Rex just played a couple of songs, and God spoke to hearts, people came forward, surrendered their lives, got things straightened out with the Lord. Amen. In verse 23, the Bible, 23, the Bible says, and when he had sent the multitudes away, see, I saw for some reason why Jesus would send his disciples away, and we're getting to that. The purpose is found here in verse 23. He went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. Jesus had purpose to pray. He had some things to pray about, to discuss with his heavenly Father. He couldn't have the disciples around. He sent them maybe to make some preparations for him on the other side. But at the same time, he still had this other uh, situation to deal with. He had a multitude of people, 5,000 people he just fed. He had to disperse them. <laughs> think about that. That's a miracle in and of itself. If you think about it, getting rid of 5,000 people who know that you can produce meals from a few fish and a couple of loaves. If you've ever had your relatives over at Christmas time and, you know, really put on the spread for them, uh, you know that they want to hang around forever. You want them to get out of there so you can get things cleaned up. But 5,000 people, I can't imagine it. But he dispersed the crowd and went on with his schedule. His schedule said to depart, to get alone, and to pray. Jesus had a lot of things to pray about. I imagine at this time he's praying for strength. I imagine at this time he's praying for some wisdom about the things that he has to deal with. I'm, I'm a, I can imagine that he prayed for a little more time, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, we talk about time. I, I know when your pastor called me, I, this is one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves. Is we've got plenty of time. Yeah. We've got plenty of time. 
It cannot be long, folks. It, it won't be long. And the Lord's coming back. We don't have a lot of time. But I keep telling myself that. I keep telling myself I got plenty of time. I got plenty of time. I got t plenty of time to read my Bible. I got plenty of time. But the time just gets frittered away, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Jesus maybe just prayed for just a little bit more time. Or maybe he just prayed for some intimacy with the Father. Maybe he just enjoyed getting along with God, the Father, none of the... None of the hoopla, none of the three-ring circus, none of the commotion, none of the miracles. It was just father and son Amen. communing together. And um, amazed sometimes that if Jesus had so much to pray about, how is it that we don't find time to pray and we don't have much to pray about? We really don't have a lot to say when we do get done praying. Oh my, bro. He was alone praying. He was on the mountain. And I think that night, if you could have heard his prayers, he pro you probably would have heard the name Judas on his lips. Yes, sir. See, Jesus prayed for his enemies. And he knew that Judas was a devil. He knew that Judas would betray him. I think he would have prayed for those scribes and Pharisees that gave him fits. I think he prayed about this trial, the justice that he was to receive. I think he discussed with his heavenly father, he probably discussed that mock trial the beating that he was going to take, the scourging, the crucifixion, how all that would transpire. And then I uh, probably think that he probably discussed funeral arrangements. <laughs> that borrowed tomb, Amen. that stone, that seal, everything that went into the death and burial of Jesus Christ. And there isn't any doubt in my mind that he spoke to him about that glorious resurrection. That would take place within three Amen. days Amen. and would change the entire world. He couldn't risk praying to God about these matters in front of his disciples. Yes, sir. If they overheard some of the things that he had discussed with God, they wouldn't understand. He was alone. He was in prayer, serious, earnest prayer. But somehow he was reminded. Look at verse 24. He was reminded that he had sent those disciples out in that ship. And I don't know how that came about, but it says in verse 24, I mean, we jump from Jesus being alone praying to verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. That's quite a jump, you know? Jesus on the mountain in prayer, and then all of a sudden we're in the middle of a storm with his 12 disciples. We had no idea that was going on. Maybe God the Father reminded him, hey, you need to check on those disciples. Uh, they're in trouble. I imagine also possibly a gust of wind just came along. That storm would have kicked up some wind in the mountain as well. Maybe just the rustling of some leaves. Maybe it was just an impression that he had. I don't know what interrupted his prayer. I don't believe necessarily that it was cut short. I think he did the business that he came to take care of. But I do know that the Bible jumps from that scene to this one. And somehow Jesus was reminded of those 12 disciples. Maybe he heard a faint cry for help. But if we go to the companion passage in Mark chapter 6, we get a little more insight into what happens next. And the Bible says in verse 47, And when the even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and watch this. And he alone on the land, verse 48, and he saw them. We don't get that from Matthew. We just jump from Jesus on the mount to the ship in trouble to Jesus on the water. But the Bible says in Mark, he saw them. He saw them toiling and rowing. And I noted this afternoon, never saw it before. The Bible's a remarkable book. Yes, it is. But in Mark, it says it was an even. <laughs> uh, it, it just dawned on me when I read that it might have been a period of time before Jesus went to them because he went to them in the fourth watch of the night Jesus might have watched them toiling and rowing through two or three watches wow just watching he could have gone at any time. And of course we know the significance, but he didn't go until the fourth watch. 
In other words, he waited probably until the height of that storm. He waited until those disciples were in a hopeless situation. Oh, you know, we want the Lord Jesus Christ to come now, but the situation is not hopeless yet, is yeah. it? We still have hope, don't we? Things are bad, but they're not that bad. We can imagine them. I know I can. Getting much worse. And that's one of the reasons why I'd like to see the Lord come back. Because I know they can get much worse. Yes, sir. But I do know this. He's coming. I know He's coming. Amen. I've got His promise. Back to, chapter, back to Matthew chapter 14. We just read one verse farther. We would have known it. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 25, it says in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus was watching. That's the clue. You know what? Tonight Jesus is watching. I don't know what kind of trouble you're in tonight, but Jesus is watching. I don't know if you're just heading into the storm tonight or coming out of it, but Jesus is watching. You know, Jesus is watching all the time. Four watches of the night and he's watching. Yeah. The rest of that time you're awake walking around with him. He's, watch, he's watching. He's watching everything you and I do. He's watching everything you and I go through. But Jesus is watching. Keep that in mind. Right. Because the longer we go, the more we're going to need the comfort of knowing that. We're going to need to know that Jesus is watching. He alone had sent them into the storm. He alone had probably prayed for them. He alone had seen them in the midst of... No one else saw them rowing and toiling in that storm. It was dark. The disciples were doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. Were they not? Yes, sir. Were they, they were in the center of God's will. Doing what God told them to do. And yet they seemed to make no progress. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I bet there are some people here tonight that could give the testimony. Yes, I was right in the middle of God's will. I was doing exactly what he told me to do. And I did not make any progress, it seemed. Why would they be unable to do what the Lord had told them to do? Why? What was it? Was that keeping them? Was it just the fact the Lord wasn't with them? No, there's, there's more to the story. Look in verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. The wind was against them. Well, if you know anything about boats, you just, you just steer that boat the other way, don't you? You just steer that boat to safety, don't you? I mean, I know people that sail boats. You, it doesn't matter which way the wind's blowing. If they want to go somewhere, they just change the tack. <laughs> Peter, James, John, they were fishermen. Yes, sir. They knew what they were doing with that boat. When they got on that boat, they probably thought, no problem. Meet you on the other side. We don't know how you're getting there, but we'll be on the other side. We'll be right where you want us to be. And this isn't going to take very long. They were probably enjoying the ride for a little while until that storm, that contrary wind came up. I imagine if they steered to the east, then the wind switched around to the east and was contrary to them. It came against them. It opposed them. I imagine that if they changed the tack and went to the south, that that wind switched around to the south and came against them. They had never seen anything like this before. You know, you can get in the center of God's will and make no progress and see things that you've never seen before and never will again. Boy, it ought to remind us to pay attention to what's going on. I imagine that if they steered that boat to the, to the north or the west, that the west wind would come against them. The north wind would... They were surrounded by winds that opposed them. The waves moving up I'm not going to try to make you seasick, but up and down, yeah. back yeah. and forth, up and down. I, I take grandma me and dad, but before I preach this message, up and down. And that boat had to roll back and forth and front to back, side to side. And they're rowing, toiling, the Bible said. They're, they are putting everything into it, but they cannot bring this boat under control. They're looking for hope. <laughs> yeah. But Jesus is nowhere around. Right. They can't see him. They can't see Jesus. And they don't know that Jesus is watching them. Isn't that so much like us? We look around. We, 
We don't see Jesus and we forget that Jesus can see us from his vantage point. We forget that Jesus is always watching. Oh, these contrary winds are against him. His eyesight is so much better than ours. He knows the precise moment to come on the water. It seems that so many things are against us. Listen, let me tell you, Christian, today, science is against you. Yes. Philosophy is against you. Other men are against you. Organized religion is against you. The devil is against you. The world is against you. Your flesh is against you. And if that's not enough, you oppose yourself sometimes. Paul warns about it in the book of Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. Warning a young man who's going to probably go into a pastor. And I can't imagine what it's like to pastor people who oppose themselves. You preach to them. You pour your heart out to them. You reveal the truth of God to them. And then you watch them be their own worst enemy. Yep. Paul warns Timothy Speaks to him in verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, yes, sir. who are taken captive by him, at his will. Right. One of the worst things you can do as a preacher is warn people about something and then watch them go and walk right into the snare of the devil. And sometimes it's not just one time. Sometimes it's over and over and over again. You know, you know if that's the case, you're captive at his will. Yeah. He takes you whenever he wants to. He knows he has the upper hand. And I'll tell you this, he will. He will take you. He wants you. James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And what did it say in Mark chapter 6 and verse 48? And he saw them toiling in Rome. He saw them. He saw the waves. He saw the storm. He saw them when all they could see was the storm. All they could see was the waves. All they could see was the distance to safety was too far for them. To the harbor, to the shore, safety was out of the question at this point. He sees them, and he comes. He comes to them. Well, isn't it wonderful when you're in the situation that these disciples find themselves in, doing something for God, striving for Him, making no progress, and you've forgotten that He watches you, but He comes, and He delivers you at the precise moment that you need deliverance. And when He comes, He comes against the wind. He comes against those things that are contrary to you. Because, just let me in, let, let, me, let me let you in on something. When you're doing the work of God, when you're on an errand for Jesus Christ, when the winds come against you, they're not coming against you. They're coming against God. So Jesus Christ comes against those things that come against these disciples. Here it's a contrary wind. In our situations, it's different. Just a metaphor. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And that's a good question, because these winds do not operate, I don't think, independently. You know, in Sunday school, we talked about the Holy Spirit of God and how he was like the wind. But the winds sometimes, the, the winds of this world are controlled by, I believe, the God of this world. They're on loan for a period of time. But he has access. He has control. It looks like they operate instinctively. But we forget they were instructed by someone. And we'll try to illustrate that if we can. While Christ is plainly seen on this mountain by us with this little picture that we've got presented to us tonight. While we can see the portrait of the disciples. You know, I think if we expanded the frame and panned the camera 
to another mountain, an opposing mountain. I think we might find the devil at a post. <laughs> I think we might find the devil watching. I think he might have observed and hated every minute of this miracle that Jesus worked and was just waiting for the moment when Jesus brought his disciples to the shore of the Sea of Galilee, gave them instructions, and then they set loose from the shore and set sail. And I believe the devil knew that he had them right where he wanted them. But you know, he didn't, he didn't hit them when they were on the shoreline, did he? No. Be too easy. He waited until, it says, in the midst of the sea. They were in the middle. In other words, it was as far this way as it was that way, every way they could possibly go. You know what the devil does sometimes to us? He gets us into a situation. He waits until you're right in the middle of it. He waits until you're in over your head. And then he, he strikes. I think we could pan to another mountain. The devil would be posted there observing, waiting for his opportunity. And in the permissive will of God, I think he mustered the winds. I think he called the west wind and the east wind. And the, this was going to be a storm like no other storm. And the north wind and the south wind. And if you know anything about the winds, they, they can't exist. They can't get along together. And they start a churning process. And I think that all started up in the mountain where Satan was at his post. And he sent them down that mountain. And any tree that wouldn't bend would break. Anything that got in his path would roll down that mountain. I think when they hit that flood plain, that wind picked up speed. It started out across the water and picked up handfuls. And would dash one bit of water, handful of water against another hand, until waves were produced, until the sea was chopping, and the winds had one target, little ship in the midst of the sea. That's the one I want. Go get it. And I imagine in my own mind that the wind made its circuit that day. The wind travels in circuits. And came back up. And of course it had to report to the one that had set it out. And I imagine the devil there standing on that mountain waiting for the wind to come back is observing that that ship is still in the midst of the sea wondering what happened. And I imagine the wind reported blows back up the other side of the mountain. It's out of breath. It's giving it everything it has. And the wind is there. And the devil is saying, the devil doing his best Darth Vader impression. What happened? I can't do the voice, but I'm sure the devil can. What happened? And the wind, knowing it has to have some kind of a reason or excuse. I don't know. I, I was, like I said, the wind's out, out of breath. I, I was blowing down the mountain. I, I don't think I've ever performed better. I think I, this was the fastest time I've ever clocked. I, I hit the water. I had that little ship was right in my sights, but I hit something. <laughs> and I can imagine the devil in disbelief saying, you hit something. You hit something. What could you possibly hit? The little ship is still there. And the wind again. I don't know. It, it was like it was like I hit a rock right in the middle of the water. Amen. I, don't, I, I, I would swear it was someone, but it, it felt like a rock. And the devil, in his unbelief, wanting to rebuke the wind. There's no rock in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. You've never failed me. You've taken hundreds of ships off this body of water for me. You've got to have a better excuse than that. There is no rock in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. I don't know, boss. But there sure is something down there now. You know, Amen. the rock of ages, Amen. Jesus Christ, Amen. at the precise moment, Amen. put himself between his disciples who were in danger. Danger of being destroyed. On that tiny little sea in that tiny little ship. Boy, it reminds me of Calvary when Jesus Christ put himself between me Amen. and the sentence of death for sins and the sentence of hell for eternity without him. His sacrifice on Calvary. Jesus Christ placed himself between that which would have harmed me, 
Jesus Christ today places himself. He comes to me in my most precarious situations and puts himself between me and those contrary winds even that are blowing today in this culture and in this country. And he brings good news. Verse 26 says, he says, be of good cheer. <laughs> it is I. Be not afraid. Amen. And if they needed anything, they needed some good news, didn't they? Amen. They needed cheer, didn't they? Amen. They needed to know that they didn't need to be afraid any more. But there was a question in their mind, wasn't it? Because he came in such an unexpected way. They had to rub their eyes and say, we can't even trust our eyes now. It looks like Jesus, but nobody can walk on the water. That's impossible. And if that's not enough, he, one of them mustered up enough courage to say, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Any guesses who it was? Yeah. Of course you know the story. Peter. Peter's the only one with enough nerve, courage to say, Lord, if it be thou, that's strange, isn't it? Suddenly, in the middle of the storm, Jesus shows up and Peter wants to get out of the boat. The only thing between him and the storm is that boat. The only thing between him and Davy Jones' locker is that boat. But he wants to walk on the water. You could say it was, you could, if, if you didn't know the, the whole story, you could say, well, this is just bravado, just an act of bravado. Uh, he wanted to be, you know, a macho man. He wanted to show everybody. The Lord called him up. Said, come. One word command. You know, that's the way it ought to be when God speaks to us. It should not be this arguing and fussing and Amen. constraining us to do things. That's right. should be one word command. Come on. Let's go. Now, when God asks you to do something impossible, and that's what we've got right here, God asked Peter to do something that was impossible. Now, I don't know if in your Christian walk with the Lord you've ever been asked to do something impossible, but if you haven't, you have something to look forward to. He tarries, because this is something. But there are some things that you need to know. Peter did not have a lot of faith. Look, he doubted. He said, if it be thou, he wasn't certain this was going to be the test. But when God asks you to do something impossible, the very first thing you and I must do is make sure that it's God. Make sure that it's God. There's a fine line between faith and foolishness. And sometimes we cross the line. Sometimes we do something foolish in the name of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get God in on our plans and do something foolish. There's a fine line between those things, and here's what you have to do. And I am convinced that in the day and age that you and I are in and going into even further, you're going to have to be able to do what John is advising us right here in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Right. Whoa. Just because you hear a voice, just because you get an impression, doesn't mean it's the truth. Just because... I warned uh, some of the young preachers that I've taught over the years, hey, listen, everything that you say in the pulpit isn't necessarily gospel. Yeah. <laughs> you can get in the preaching. You can ruin what God's doing. Be careful what you're doing. Follow the leading of the Spirit of God. Believe, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, Amen. whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Whoa, really? You mean some of the preachers that I listen to aren't from God? You mean some of the preachers who get behind a pulpit and with a King James Bible sometimes, a, a suit and tie and a shirt, maybe they have huge ministries, they're not from God. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Many false prophets. Yeah. And then in verse 2 he says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God and this is that spirit of Antichrist. Listen, if there was ever a day and age when we ought to be expecting the spirit of Antichrist to be saying something, it would be this day and age because we're that close. That's right. If the devil ever wanted to con create confusion in a society. He's accomplished it in America. Yes, sir. 
We've gone from Lester Roloff to what we have today. Are you kidding me? You talk about absolute confusion. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have the Spirit of God within you. If that voice isn't coming from within you, and listen, if that voice is coming from within you and it ain't the Spirit of God, whoa, yeah. you better be careful. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God, and that's the key. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Listen, in this day and age, discernment has gone out the window, even in a lot of good churches. Yes, sir. And I believe it will be a matter of life and death before Jesus comes that you're going to have to discern the spirit of God in your life. Or you will be totally deceived and carried off. You have to become so acquainted with the voice of God. You have to get so close to God. Like Jesus Christ. In intimate fellowship with his Father before this miracle. I'm not saying you're going to work miracles. But God can. Amen. Amen. And you can witness them. And you might even be able to be a part of them. If you are close enough to him. And you follow him couple of things. First of all, in regards to these impossibilities, whatsoever God asks you to do is not an impossibility. It's your perception. You know, we look at things that God asks us to do at times and we say, I can't do that. That's impossible. That's our perceived uh, perception of what God asks us to do. Right. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, the Bible says, I can do all things, and watch this, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. In Mark chapter 10, verse 27, the Bible says, And Jesus looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Right. It's perception. It's how you're looking at it. You can look at a problem, or you can look at a command of God and say, That's impossible. But God's not thinking that way, because He says, With me, through Christ, it's possible. And I'm going to show you how this lines up. Peter wasn't just going to walk on the water, was he? He was going to walk with God. God was walking on the water. When God calls you out and says, come, he's not asking you to do something impossible that he's not doing. He is walking on the water. He never calls his disciples to do something that he's not fully capable or doing or has done himself. He's walking on the water with God. But not only that, he's walking on the water through Christ. The invitation itself, come! That's the key. When you attempt the impossible in the will of God, is that God will never ask you to do something he's not already doing himself. Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now how long do you think it took him to get out of that boat? I don't think it took very long. I think it was almost an immediate response. Peter was like that. He was impulsive. Now what do we have here? Let's look at, let's look at what we have. We got the disciples in a boat. In the middle of the sea. In the middle of a storm. The Lord is walking to them on the water. He's almost there. And Peter goes crazy. I can't imagine the other 11 disciples not saying something about Peter getting out of the boat. See, sometimes this is a surprise to Christians. But other believers, a lot of times, they either don't see what you see or they don't have the desire that you have. Peter had a desire to walk with God. Amen. Amen. I, I can imagine that the other disciples, three or four of them, any one of them that could have gotten a hand on Peter and on a roar at, a roar at the same time was trying to grab a hold of Peter and say, Peter, Peter, you can't go out there. You can't. No one's ever walked on with Peter. Oh, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Have you had that experience? I, I, uh, we reminisced a little bit uh, over, I think, dinner yesterday, possibly, or today. I can't remember. They all kind of run together. But the Heatons told me about some people that when they decided to go off to school and prepare for the ministry, about some people that 
counseled them against going down to school. Counseled them against doing something that in his heart he knew God wanted him to do. Wow. Just imagine that he had taken that counsel. Imagine Peter had not gotten up. Imagine that the other 11 disciples, it's 11 on 1. Imagine that Peter had never gotten up. We wouldn't have the story. We wouldn't have this example. And I read this today and I thought, well, man, everybody isn't reading the Bible like you are, Bob. You're reading it. You're believing it. You know it. <laughs> and I thought, some people read this and they just think, oh, th that isn't possible. You know what your problem is? You know too much about water. That's what the problem yeah. is. You know, we know about water. Water covers two-thirds of the globe, doesn't it? You know, it's H2O. You know what those are? Those are gases. And gases combine, and they combine water. H2 helium. Is it helium? Hydrogen. Is it helium? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. I knew someone would know, even if I didn't. <laughs> two hydrogen atoms or nuclear or whatever they are, and you put them together with one oxygen, and you got water. You got a liquid out of two gases. Uh, that sounds impossible to me. And then, uh, if that's not enough... That's a, fact, that's a fact that we know about. You know what scientists know about water? It'll clean you up, and you know that as well as I do. You know that they uh, know it cools you on a hot day. It evaporates up into the air, goes back into the clouds, comes down to the precipitation. Uh, you know, they know that it's teeming with life. They know how to treat it to make it drinkable. They know a lot of things about water. But no scientist will ever get out and walk on the water. Why? Because they're reading the wrong book. They're reading the science book. Amen. I'm reading the sovereign word of God. Amen. If he said it, I believe it. Amen. Peter walked on the water. He walked with God. He walked in Christ to him. Oh, scientists know so much. Science is against you. Don't forget it. That's right. But I'll tell you who will try. No scientist will ever try to get out of a boat. Not a perfectly good boat. But I'll tell you who will. Someone trying to follow Jesus Christ. If he says, come. Amen. Uh, and this isn't something Peter worked on. He didn't, he didn't go down to the Sea of Galilee and try to skip across the water like a stone one day. He didn't draw water in a bathtub and try to walk from bubble to bubble or anything. He didn't have any experience. He'd never been in a storm like this. He'd never seen Jesus walking on, never seen anybody walking on the water. What a crazy notion. If it's you, Lord, let me come to you. So what's the difference? Why would he try now? I mean, in the middle of all this fear and all this confusion, why would he try now? The only safety he had was the boat. That's what 11 voices were telling him. The only safety you have is right here, Peter, when it's about to be turned into matchsticks, toothpicks. But Proverbs 21 and verse 31, you know that verse had already been written? When Peter was in his boat, yeah. he may have had thoughts about it. But here's what it says. The horse is prepared against the day of battle. Good to have a horse when you're battling somebody, especially on foot. Yeah. But safety is of the Lord. Right. Oh, wow. Man, all, all Peter had to do was think of that verse and realize that boat, nothing. Safety's there. Safety's with Christ. Safety's with God. He, Peter knew that if I can get to Christ, right. I'll be safe. Amen. If I can get to the rock, I don't have to hold on. He'll hold on to me. Amen. That if he could get to the Lord, that he would be safer than any place else he could be. I mentioned I lived in the city, the old south end in Toledo. Not a good place. I was sharing some of the stories with your pastor. Uh, this afternoon at uh, uh, this evening at uh, supper I've seen a lot of things there I had a friend come up when I first moved into Toledo and he knew it, his way around he was an old lost fellow that I had worked with years ago and God saved remarkably saved you wouldn't believe this guy I mean he was a drunk I worked construction with him he he was a mess but he had gotten saved and uh, he had some brothers that played guitar. They came up, and he came up one night and played some music with me. But he drove into my neighborhood. And when he got in my house, I knew he was a little uh, distraught. <laughs> and one of the first things he asked me before we even ate or played or anything, he said, Brother, you know where you are? And I said, I thought just for a second, but I thought, well, I know what he's talking about. He, he drove down Broadway and came down Dunwood Court. Yeah. And uh, 
I thought for just a little bit, and I thought, yeah, I know where I'm at, brother. I know what he wanted me to say, but I said, I'm in the center of God's will as far as I know, and there isn't a safer place for me to be than right here. Now, you think I like Toledo? I don't. <laughs> but it's where God wants me. You think it's safe there? It ain't. I didn't tell your uh, pastor this, but one, one Father's Day, uh, some of the locals, they... Uh, clipped that little electric uh, seal on my electric, uh, what do you call that? Meter. Meter. I just happened to be mowing the yard and see it, and I thought, well, that seal's gone, clipped. What's that all about? I know it had been there. So I called the electric company, and I told them, you know, you, know, you might want to send somebody down here and do something with this electric box. I said, if... Uh, if this thing ain't sealed, somebody can pull it out. And I said, if somebody gets their hand in there, I said, why, well, yeah, anything could happen. Somebody could get electrocuted, and y'all could get sued. Well, they were concerned about that because they told me very quickly, well, that's your responsibility, sir. So if somebody is going to be sued, it'll be you. And I thought, whoa, I didn't know that. But I don't have those seals. Well, it, it wasn't 20 minutes, and there were two big electric trucks in my neighborhood looking for that cover that was gone and that seal where it was. We looked all around the bushes. We went to some other houses to see if we could rob one off of them and get one on there because they didn't know exactly where to They called another truck and brought one in. But they told me this. Yeah, just about before they're going to do one of these uh, where they break in, you know, they just barge into your house with three or four people and, you know, pretty much do whatever they want, take whatever they want. Yeah, they, uh, they pop this little cover off of your uh, electric meter so they can just come over here after dark and then put you in the dark and... You can't turn a light on, and then they're in. I thought, well, okay, that's good to know. Okay. They're coming. I pretty much figured that. They put a new seal on, but I figured, well, they can cut that one. They can pull the other cover off. They can do that in a second. So I set up a couple of nights with a shotgun. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> I thought, well, if they do come in, they're going to get surprised, even if it is dark. <laughs> But safety's of the Lord. They never came. They never came. And I know who kept them from coming. Amen. It wasn't the electric company, even though I called them and took every precaution. <laughs> it reminds me of this young sailor that was shipwrecked one night, and the rescuers, because of the storm, couldn't get to him. And all he could do was latch onto a rock that night and the next morning early or late they, they finally got to him and they asked him about the conditions of the storm. Oh, he said, I, I trembled with fear. He said, I, I shook at the thought of death. He said, but the rock never moved all night. Jesus Christ cannot be moved. Amen. And because of that, because of the safety, safety is of the Lord. Peter triumphed. You know, a lot of times we tell this story and we say, well, Peter looked at the storm. He sank. No, I, I think you miss it. Because when Peter got out of the boat, it says that he, he walked to be with Jesus. And when it was all over, he was with Jesus. And he was the only one that walked. And I just kind of picture it this way. I, it, could be, it could not be this way. But I imagine that as soon as they got to land, they're all soaking wet. Doesn't say the Lord miraculously dried their clothes out. I've never had him do that for me. My, my coat's wet. I'm not going to be miraculously dry when I get done. I imagine that they built a little fire and maybe maybe they fixed not coffee but something hot to drink. They all sat around, huddled around that fire, maybe had a shawl on because it was starting to maybe get cool or heat up. I don't know. But they all sat around that fire drying out. And I imagine that either James or John said, Man, Peter, you crazy nut. Getting out of the boat? Are you kidding? What are you thinking? And then one other of them probably said, Man, Peter, go for a while there. For a while there. You were walking on water. Oh. And Peter, probably still in shock, he didn't know what just happened. He probably thought about it for a minute. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did walk on water. None of you guys get out of the boat. You know, I think when we get to heaven, we're all going to get to tell a few stories. <laughs> it's so much fun doing it here. I think we're going to have some time to tell a few stories. We're going to be able to talk about what the Lord did for us and what he allowed us to do with him. 
And Peter's yeah. the only one. Yeah. I don't think they talked about Peter denying the Lord. I don't think they talked about Peter, you know, saying, not so, Lord. And the Lord saying, get thee behind. I don't think they talked about any of those things. I think every once in a while somebody brings it up and says, man, Peter, you did something nobody else ever did do. Nobody else ever will do. Oh, I wish I would have got out of the Amen. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes tonight? Now listen, you're going to get where you're going. I guarantee you that. You have the promise of God on it. No matter what the devil throws at you, and along the way God may just ask you if he hasn't already to do something impossible. This ought to encourage you tonight. If he does, when he does, obey that one word command. Just come. I'm going to open the altar tonight. I know it's hot. You may not need to come. If you don't, why don't? It's early in the meeting. You got, you know, just like we said, lie to yourself. You got plenty of time. Brother Heaton said tonight, this it'll be Friday before you turn around. And you won't remember the preaching tonight. Unless the Lord reminds you. Maybe you need to come tonight. Maybe it's just a walk with the Lord that you need help. Maybe that's what seems to be impossible to you. Maybe it's just a regular prayer time. Maybe it's something as simple as a witness saying to other believers. Those things sometimes to us look impossible, but with God they are possible. We're going to have the pianist play just one verse of one song. If nobody comes, I'll pray. And you know the mosquitoes aren't out yet, but I'll be on the road before too long and be back in Toledo, back in the routine just like you tomorrow, waiting for the Lord to come, waiting for my next orders, just go ahead and play one verse, one song. We sang that song tonight, Throw Out the Lifeline. And the Lord just kind of confirmed to me, man, you're preaching about a boat tonight. Preaching about the lifeline. I was the lifeline for Peter. Jesus Christ was the lifeline for me. There's a line in that song that talks about the lifeboat. Jesus is the lifeboat. I, I, I'm on that lifeboat. My, I've been saved. But I know some people that aren't. I know some people that I can throw that lifeline out to. I know some people that I can help get on that boat. All I have to do is follow the leading of the Spirit and have that happen.